Hi, everyone. So welcome to uh, Casey and I School Day 5. It's been a, a roller coaster week so far. Um, and uh, the roller coaster isn't going to stop, at least until the end of today. And then you have the weekend <laughs> to take a bit of a breather before hopping back on. Hi, everyone. Um, so, so welcome to uh, Casey and I School oh. Day 5. Excuse me. It's been a, a roller coaster week so wow. far. Um, and uh, the roller coaster isn't. Oh, that, that, that gives me the opportunity <laughs> to take a bit of a brief. Explain to people that the uh, the, the way I, I am going to be monitoring the chat um, in the session today when I have my thing on full screen is uh, I have the thing on on my phone, um, but I certainly need to mute it um, at some point before I do that. So yeah, welcome everyone. We're going to just let some people trickle in um, for another um, two, three minutes before we start proper, but we wanted to just jump in and uh, let you guys know that we're here for you. Uh, and I thought what we can do in this uh, trickling in phase as well is um, uh, is is have a bit of uh, uh, info from you guys on the chat as well. So, you know, we, we had um, some polls previously from from Itai and um, there's been, you know, we know we know a fair bit about you guys as well. Mm -hmm. But let's, um, I, I want to just give people the opportunity to kind of shout, give, do some shout outs on the chat right now um, of, of anyone who's um, has a particular interest in the content of day five, if they're working in an area that's related to this, like neuroimaging or physiological modeling, whole brain modeling, or um, any of these things, uh, you know, has projects, has special interests and so on. Like let's, let, let's, let's hear from you guys um, so that so that we can uh, maybe kind of customize some of the things that we say and uh, and get the discussion going. Erin likes neuroimaging. I second that. Again, for people who've just uh, tuned in, we're just going to do another, another minute or two of the shuffling in, filtering in thing in the, in the virtual format. So just sit with us and get comfy. Grab your coffee, grab your water. Ooh. Turn and does applied math. I'm oh. curious if it's relevant to today, today's topic. Well, that's that's an interesting point. I mean, mm -hmm. definitely depending on exactly what, what you're thinking about, there's applications of applied math to um, whole brain modeling in a number mm -hmm. of ways. And we can definitely discuss that some more along the along the day. No. Oh. Actually, genomic, genomics isn't that far, as Dan yeah. Felsky will say, because, well, he knows. He, he does yeah. imaging genomics. He's a man of an old imaging genomics or imaging genomics past um, and present, perhaps. Yeah, we will. I, I think I'm, I'm afraid, Dan, today might be a bit genomics light. Apologies for that in advance. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you can you can help us fill in the gaps. Yeah. I almost threw in, well, well, we have a really packed day, but I almost threw in because there's there's a really nice new um, Python package for actually combining Allen Brain, um, Allen Brain with, with imaging coordinates now. Right, right. Um, coming out of Montreal. Yeah, that, that's that's something that there's a lot of, it's been a lot of innovative work using that, mm -hmm. that kind of magic combo in recent years. So it's good to know that that's, being provided for. Sophie says functional or structural. Is this is like a vote? Are you saying which is best, functional or structural? Uh, I don't know. I don't think I can make the call on that one. I mean, you always you always think as a, as a um, a young scientist going in. At least like my experience was always in, you know, uh, structural MRI is boring. Get give me the fMRI. Give me the uh, the brain mm -hmm. activity stuff. But um, actually, over the course of my career actually I've um, increasingly come to kind of take a special interest in the uh, nuances of anatomy and there's a lot of um, a lot of interesting stuff you can do and a lot of interesting things about neuroanatomy so I, I'm on the fence on that one Sophie I'm afraid yeah and and you could argue that that the new the new cool part of functional is, is really anatomy and structural <laughs> So right. a lot of a lot of this a lot of this exciting gradients or individualized parcellations yeah. are really just trying to use functional to, to get more information about anatomy at this time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the 
the trope sometimes that isn't is it like 100% wrong but obviously we disagree with is that um, functional neuroimaging is neophrenology mm -hmm. and uh, it's kind of it, it Everything you do with, you'd say, human brain mapping in general, um, brain activity measurements, are the kind of certainly non-invasively, has an anatomical component. Like it's, uh, it's part of the the picture. Like there's nothing really interesting or relevant that you would want to know and want to measure that you wouldn't want to situate anatomically. So there is no, there is no distinction, <laughs> hard distinction between function and anatomy. Dan would like to learn about distinctions between meso and macro scale models of brain physiology. Um, Dan, that is definitely something that I can, if my memory um, doesn't fail me, uh, touch on along the way. That'll come in in the afternoon. Actually, I'll come in briefly in the morning, but I'll expand on that in the afternoon. Um, because in a nutshell, like one person's meso is another person's macro. So there's this kind of a, a terminology kind of term. I've used this phrase recently in a, in a, in a review, I use the phrase terminological bog, um, which um, was um, a, a little bit uh, uh, informal, but kind of, I think got to get to the point. Um, but yeah, we can talk about meso versus macro and meso versus micro and micro versus macro and all that. All right, good. Um, enough of the small talk. <laughs> Let us proceed. So I will share my slides and we will crack on. OK. Um, Slides okay, and do I need to minimize? Can you need or, to? You can hide that. Do I need um, to focus? Yes, yeah, that thing. Are the, is think the so. slides big, or do I need to do the focus thing? The slides are big. Slides are big. All right, good. Um, so welcome again, everyone. Um, hopefully everyone's shuffled in. Who's going to shuffle in? I'm sure some people will be late, but um, we shall proceed. So uh, again, this is day five of um, Casey and I summer school, and um, the topic for today is whole brain modeling and neuroimaging connectomics. Um, and when I, one of the things I'm gonna do over the next uh, 10 minutes or so of kind of pressy is, is give you some, some initial comments on why those two things go together. Uh, but first some preliminaries, um, as we've heard before, but we, we want to repeat, um, we, we want to acknowledge the uh, land on which CAMH is situated, which are lands that have been occupied, occupied by the First Nations for millennia. They're rich in civilizations with knowledge of medicine, architecture, technology, and extensive trade routes throughout the Americas. In 1860, the site of CAMH appeared in the Colonial Records Office of the British Crown as the council grounds of the Mississaugas of the New Credit, as they were known at the time. And today, Toronto is covered by the Toronto Purchase Treaty Number 13, 1805, with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Toronto is now home to a vast diversity of First Nations, Inuit and Meti who enrich the city and CAMH and those of us who, who represent CAMH uh, and are part of the CAMH family are committed to reconciliation. So we will honor the land through programs, places um, that reflect and respect its heritage and will embrace the healing traditions of the ancestors and weave them into our caring practices. And on that note, the um, this little guy on the right hand side, the the bear. So the, there's actually a center at CAMH called um, Shikabi Makwa. Um, and this is a center that um, uh, does a number of things, but is is uh, ha has a focus on uh, mental health for um, in, in a First Nations context, context, like doing research, doing advocacy, working on policy, and also um, working with um, First Nations communities to um, address challenges that, that they face. Um, and um, this is a you know, really great initiative. The bear is a, um, a symbol of uh, knowledge, protection and healing in many First Nations cultures. So it's, a, it's an appropriate um, glyph there for Shikabi Makwa. Great. So uh, also just preliminaries, we have our code of conduct. We do not, uh, we intend to provide a, a harassment-free learning experience for everyone, regardless of gender, gender identity, expression, sexual orientation, disability, physical appearance, body size, 
race, age, or religion, and we will not tolerate harassment of any form. Forms of harassment are listed there in case people are unsure. And just in terms of engagement, so uh, we've been having some uh, great conversations with people so far in on a number of our, our venues, on the chat, um, which is always great because it kind of runs in real time. Um, but also we have the Slack, just to remind people, um, also some great conversations there, and the Gather Town. Um, and we'll, we'll be at the Gather Town. I'll be at the Gather Town uh, in, the, uh, in the breaks, so you can come and Mm -hmm. follow up on things you found particularly interesting um, or things that you didn't hear that you really want to um, bring in, we're, we're here to extend the conversation with you in that space. Yeah, and we want to remind you that um, if any of this feels too too fast, because we're going we're gonna to go lightning speed through a lot of exciting methods today, um, you always have the option to, to pause, to, to step back and to rewatch the content um, at a slower pace. Um, using our Crowdcast platform. So you can navigate to previous talks by clicking on the schedule, which is the word schedule above our heads right now, um, underneath the word Casey and I Summer School on your interface. Yeah, that's a, that's a really great feature of Crowdcast. And um, I actually benefited a lot from rev reviewing the um, last year's materials as, um, as I was getting ready for the session today. We've, we've mixed things up a little bit, which I'll, I'll explain a little bit later as well, relative to last year. Um, so, so just kind of let's bring us up to today with respect to the last week. We we heard about um, uh, microcircuit modeling yesterday, in particular from Itai and a great job from Frank and um, the you know a number of other interesting topics before then. The there's there's a there's a kind of nucleus in the middle of the summer school and also case and I in general, which is really focused on computational neuroscience. And that nucleus, in terms of the the schedule for the for the summer school, is Thursday, yesterday, Friday, today, and Andrea on Monday. So um, there's there's many many relations to other parts of the um, other other parts of the program. But um, I think it's kind of useful to know that there's there's this kind of little three three day unit that there'll be a lot of reference back and forth on specifically on topics of computational neuroscience and. Uh, and human brain physiology. So today, I'm going to come back to this um, and expand uh, in, a, in a few more slides. But just to give you kind of a quick flavor of what the, what the plan is, we're actually going to mix it up this time relative to previous days in that um, for the morning session, we're going to do a uh, interleaved lecture workshop uh, format, um, which, which I'll, I'll give you some more details on in a bit. And so that's going to be neuroimaging connectomics, two sessions in the morning, and then in the afternoon we'll act, we'll revert to the lecture then tutorial format, and um, that's where we'll talk about whole brain modeling specifically. And uh, so I'll give the lecture, and then I'll give the workshop to cap off the day. The instructors for this session is me, and I haven't introduced myself yet, which uh, I apologize. So. Um, so my name is John Griffiths. Um, I'm the lead of the whole brain modeling group at the KCNI, also an assistant professor at U of T in psychiatry and medical sciences. Um, nothing more interesting to say about me for the time being, but um, Erin Dickey, I, I, I do want to kind of emphasize you've already heard a fair bit from her um, over the week and uh, in preparation for the school as well. You'll know already um, that she's a, She's an expert in um, in neuroinformatics and uh, and reproducible science and and also uh, neuroscience education. What you may not be so familiar with is that she's also a world recognized expert in functional neuroimaging analysis and specifically neuroimaging analysis related to surface based um, analysis of fMRI data, which she'll tell you some great things about today. So, Erin. Uh, Anything to add? In in that summary? Um, no, I have to put yep. a blush emoji in the chat. Uh, <laughs> great, great. Yeah. Okay, so we've got um, and I'll I'll hand over to Erin shortly. By the way, so um, you, if you get bored of my voice, just hang hang in there. I'll be I'll be hanging over the baton, handing over the baton fairly shortly. Um, we have TAs for this session as well. 
so hats off to Kevin and Shreyas from my group and Jerry from uh, Kimmel. So these guys will be here for you today. Um, I also got to thank Jerry before we even start because um, some of these slides are totally his um, from other neuroimaging events that, that he has taught. He's, he's done a lot of um, work recently in, in developing really great neuroimaging curricula. And if you want to really expand on the, on the stuff we're going to be teaching today, you should really check out the data cover to neuroimaging curriculum that he's been putting together. Yeah, I certainly second um, Jerry is, uh, is a neuroimaging methods uh, superman, and uh, we all know that here, but he, he definitely deserves the nod for that as well. Uh, okay, so a little bit more on recapping to bring us up to today is what we what we saw from uh, from day three onwards, we had the you know interesting sessions in in the first few days about clinical applications, uh, clinical framing, and um, and uh, um, uh, equity and fairness in in AI and uh, and healthcare. And then from day three onwards, we've been doing this progression up the the biological hierarchy, if you like, going from uh, hearing about genetics and uh, um, and genomics, and then in yesterday we were thinking with ETI a lot about cells, circuits, um, and then up to today, which is day five, um, we're going to be going that next step up and thinking about um, again to some extent cells, but certainly circuits and systems. And th just to to kind of zoom in even further on on those last two points, the um, the and, and this is something that I, I will revisit as well as referring to earlier, Dan, um, in terms of meso, macro, micro. Um, this is this is just a little sketch of like the the spatial scales that we deal with um, uh, levels of organization in um, in neuroscience. But I'm thinking in particular about computational neuroscience here. And um, so so the the things that you heard yesterday with um, with Itai and Frank were as as you will remember were you know taking seriously the biophysical details of individual neurons and then moving up to neural populations and thinking about circuits and those circuit models, they were like, you know, basically one of these little slice things here. Um, and then today, so we're kind of starting at this point and then moving upwards. Um, and, and also that'll be one of, that'll be, that, that kind of describes as well the, the context for day six as well. Um, now, why are we, Doing, doing this this double team thing here with uh, whole brain modeling and neuroimaging connectomics. Now, the it's it's not a coincidence. So the this this field of whole brain modeling it's a, it's a, a subfield of computational neuroscience that although it has a number of ingredients that have like it like any field or a kind of new scientific uh, area the the individual components go back a long time they're like a lot of the the tools and the theories have been uh around for decades if uh, or like maybe maybe longer um maybe even centuries but they really coalesced in the kind of early 2000s early early to mid 2000s um in combination with this parallel in, um development that was going on in neuroimaging which was thinking about large scale brain ac brain activity and structure from the perspective of basically network science. So when I talk about neuroimaging connectomics, the, um, the one way of thinking about that as a, um, a combination of ideas is, is network science applied to brain, uh, large, uh, large scale brain organization. Um, that would be one way of thinking about it. And, this field of whole brain modeling this this really emerged around about the same time it was like the mid 2000s late 2000s and then really kind of took off in the in the first in the second decade of this century and that's so so their neuroimaging connectomics and whole brain modeling are really best friends and i do think that the uh, the toast and the jam is the is the right uh, metaphor here because the the uh, the connectomics gives the the foundation, and then the whole brain modeling is is certainly a certain kind of special special source that builds on top of that. And and to be a little bit more concrete about that, which we'll also discuss in a lot more detail as we go along. So the the uh, components of a whole brain modeling, um, a whole brain model of the type that we 
we work with, sometimes called a connectome-based neural mass model as well, um, are really there's really two t two parts of them. There's on the, on the left hand side these these structural components, which we'll be hearing a lot about shortly, um, which is defining anatomical brain networks with various types of uh, methodologies, but particularly diffusion weighted MRI tractography is one of the main ones, and and also using what we call brain parcellations to cut the brain up into manageable chunks, um, and also looking at functional imaging data, um, activity patterns, those are often the things that we want to explain. That's one of those ingredients. And then the, the, other, the other part, the computational neuroscience or the mathematical modeling side, that's the other uh, ingredient in, in whole brain modeling. So it really makes sense to think about uh, these two as a as a pair um, and and also in terms of the broad picture of uh, biomedical research and neuroinformatics and uh, um, uh, just brain science of um, in relation to mental health and in in relation to other er areas of psychiatry and neurology uh, neuroimaging in general is a huge part of that so we want to represent that as well but we're not we're not just talking about neuroimaging today. We're talking specifically about this particular um, angle, if you like, or particular uh, emphasis within neuroimaging, which, as it happens, is one of the major ones um, at this point in time. It wasn't necessarily ten years ago, but it really is kind of the dominant perspective in neuroimaging, which is thinking about um, brain organization from the perspective of connectomics. So more more on whole brain modeling later. But for now, we're going to, for the rest of the morning, we're going to be focusing on neuromaging connectomics. And the arrangement that we're going to be following is, as I said, we're going to be uh, tag, team tag teaming between myself and Erin. And we're going to do this in essentially four, four slots that will take us, the first two taking us up to our break at halfway through the morning, and then the second two taking us up to the uh, lunchtime. Um, so the first two, We'll be thinking about brain structure. Um, Aaron, in a minute, will talk to you about some foundational neuroimaging um, tools, techniques, concepts, and uh, looking at code and data in a practical way um, in relation to uh, brain anatomy. Um, and then I'm going to continue on the, the anatomy, but look specifically at, at uh, white matter anatomy and using a particular type of technique called diffusion weighted MRI. Then in the afternoon, then in the second part of the morning, we'll be thinking about brain function, and again, we'll do the double team. But Erin will kick off with um, her special area of expertise, which is fMRI, and then I'll um, I'll be finishing up the morning with uh, a brief touching on uh, EEG and MEG from the perspective of neuroimaging connectomics as well. Great. Okay, so this is the point where I'm going to hand over to Erin, and. Um, Take a breather. So I'm going to I'm going to kill my slides, and in the process, I'm also going to just take the opportunity to ask questions. So, any questions in the chat right now? Anyone, you know, unclear about any of the things we said, or have any particular uh, particular things they'd like us to, to highlight from what I've what I've mentioned so far? If if anything comes up, just throw it in the chat. We're monitoring this along the way. So, Erin, uh, over to you. Okay, Aaron, Aaron's just uh, refreshing and returning. Yeah, you're muted right now, Aaron. Sorry, I had, a, I had a weird situation where something was sitting on top of the controls and I couldn't do anything. That happened. 
things. Anyway. So let's talk about neuroimaging connectomics. Screen two. Uh, before I talk about all the fun um, in the intro, I wanna I wanna tell people uh, who potentially are uh, thinking of using Docker um, for for the discussion that you might need to repull the Docker this morning because I went and added a couple new neuroimaging tools into it last night, very late. Um, so if that is true, then I'm just gonna demo that right now. Uh, you can do Docker image LS. We'll show you what Dockers you have. And the one that we want to update is this eDicky KCNI School Jupyter one. So to update it, you say Docker pull eDicky KCNI School. that right Let's see. and and then you should see things happening uh, where it's downloading new layers that I added last night awesome okay um, and I should I should say before I do that that this instruction to do that is also in the readme for today so if you go to the Casey and I school lessons Uh, repo, which I just posted to the chat, and then go into the day five folder and look at the README. Uh, you should have some information about how to be able to run the lessons today, including instruction, including this line about how to pull the newest version of the Docker. Okay, that was a disclaimer. We'll come back to fun with code after, but let's talk about neuroimaging. Present. Awesome. Okay. Uh, so we're going to start with just a basic. Uh, this morning, I'm going to we're going to start with uh, what is magnetic resonance imaging. Um, and I'm not going to go there's, there's people who could go way farther into what exactly it is. But this is actually a picture from the CAMH website. I believe this might actually be CAMH's MRI unit. Um, and what it is is a machine uh, that uses a big magnet uh, to take pictures of your brain. Um, and basically it can take pictures of the brain because a lot of physicists uh, and medical engineers realized that different tissues in your body have different magnetic properties. Um, and especially fatty tissues have more different magnetic properties than less fatty tissues. And because the white matter in your brain has a lot of fat in it, the white matter looks different than gray matter and we can get pretty pictures of uh, what your brain looks like. So this picture on the console is what we usually think about uh, first, when we think about structural MRI, uh, we call this the T1 weighted image and T1 weighted contrast is just something we get uh, to usually look at anatomy of the brain and it has these nice properties that uh, white matter shows up white, um, <laughs> this version, and gray matter shows up gray. And what can we do with this? So there's been like, uh, when, we, when these scanners were invented in the 90s, we thought it was the decade of the brain and we thought all we need to do was put uh, patients or clients into scanners and suddenly we would understand um, all of the origins of mental health in the next 10 years um, and everything would be great, uh, similar to when genetics started. And, and we didn't quite get there very fast, uh, but we did, we did see some really interesting changes. So one, one thing we did see was that, especially in the cases of schizophrenia, we did see actually differences um, in the shape and the con con composition of the brain. So this is actually a more recent paper from uh, what a group called the Enigma Consortium. Um, and the Enigma Consortium actually pools data sets, uh, in this case, from clinical samples. And, this, and in this case, it's kind of a mega analysis across multiple disorders. Uh, and they're actually just looking at differences in the thickness of the cortex at multiple areas of the brain um, across different, uh, different disorder cases. Uh, and you can see that for the case of schizophrenia, there's actually thinner cortex um, in almost all of the brain areas. Uh, but when we look at some other cases like ADHD, ADHD and uh, major depressive disorder, which we focused a lot on, on the school, there's actually very few differences um, that you can actually see with the naked eye 
or that you can actually quantify um, with this incredibly well-powered study. Um, which which brings the idea that sometimes you can sometimes you can see evidence of uh, brain disorder of uh, psychiatric disorders in the brain, but a lot of times you can't uh, just with structure. Um, but interestingly, in the cases where you can see um, differences in the thickness of the cortex, are usually the ones with the strongest heritability and genetic risk. And there's actually a correlation here between genetic the correlation of genetic risk across disorders and the correlation of genetic uh, risk across uh, structural brain differences. That's my basic in that's my basic uh, uh, that's my basic introduction to things we can do with structural MRI just to understand differences between uh, people with psychiatric disorders and healthy controls. This is this idea of this case control comparison. Um, what we're really here to talk about today is, is ways that we go beyond this, that we talk about connectomics, that we try to do even fancier things or drive fancier version measures from the brain. Uh, but we're going to start with what you have to do with a brain in order for things to happen. Okay, um, so we're going to start with T1 weighted processing. Uh, so I told you the T1 weighted scan is the one where you can see differences between gray matter and white matter. Uh, with that scan, you can throw it into a pipeline, just let it let the computer churn for like 16 hours, and suddenly you'll get labels of multiple different parts of the brain. Um, and in the process, it will have taken that image, it will have figured out where the brain is. This is surprisingly the hardest thing for the computer to do for some reason, is just find the brain. Um, this is this is where it always goes wrong. Um, and then, and then another step that's really important is it is that it actually takes that brain and it actually warps it and twists it to try to look like nobody's brain, which is the average brain. Um, and we'll, we'll, we're going to talk when we get into atlases about why that happens. And then afterwards, fanciness can occur, and we can um, we can label all the different little parts of the brain. We can label all the subcortical structures, uh, and more fun, we can find the the, the borders between gray matter and white matter, and the borders between gray matter and the outside of the brain. So these anatomical pipelines, what they're really exciting for is that once they segment tissue, once they figure out where uh, the cerebral spinal fluid is or the outside of the brain, the gray matter and the white matter, it can use that information in combination to fit a mesh uh, to services of, to your cortical surface. Um, and we're gonna look a little bit at these mesh objects once they get fit uh, when we go into the tutorial, but it's kind of cool that the mesh is made out of triangles. Um, it's like a wire mesh or like chicken wire wrapped around your brain. Um, but it's it's following one of these two surfaces. So this, this uh, white matter surface, which is the border between the white matter and the gray matter, and this red surface, which is the border between uh, the gray matter and the outside of the brain. And then the important thing as we go into connectomics is that all of this happens uh, because when we think about connectomics, we're really talking about whether one brain region talks to another. Um, and atlases and parcellations, or uh, the application of a brain atlas or parcellation is the way that we can chop the brain up into little bits so that we can define two brain regions that we want to see if they talk to each other. Um, so an atlas or a parcellation is, is a concept that I'm going to use uh, in I'm going to use them kind of interchangeably, but we essentially mean something that that labels brain areas. Um, and this idea of what is a brain region is actually kind of um, kind of difficult. I mean, maybe I'll ask in the in the chat if anybody wants to to take a second and tell me what do they think what do what do they think you need to do to label a brain region? What do you think constitutes a brain region? It's a big question for very early in the morning. Anybody? John, you want to chip it? Broadman, that's a good example. Uh, yeah, so Broadman, yeah, exactly. Does it say Broadman? Some say it depends what you're looking for. It's very true. So Broadman defined brain regions uh, according, like, over a hundred years ago now, um, according to actually uh, looking at histology of actually only a couple of people's brains. 
um, and, and uh, looking at the thickness of cortical layers um, and trying to find places where they thought the thickness of cortical layers were more similar. So based on anatomy and, and define uh, cortical regions based on that. Um, but we can also go, we can also use different neuroimaging modalities to try to figure out what a brain region is. And there's an entire area of science um, and, and multiple areas that have been described about what a brain area is. I'm just gonna talk about, I'm gonna give the example when we go through the tutorials. Awesome. Of uh, uh, three examples, um, but these are, these are definitely not all of them and not even all of my favorites. Um, Harvard Oxford Atlas, this is, this is the thing that used to come in the knots with your neuroimaging package to tell you what anatomical area your, your finding was in. So everybody thought about the brain in terms of these regions. Um, and it, it's a pretty coarse uh, parcellation um, in volume space of that uh, generally this part at the back is, or this part at the back is visual and, and we'll talk about that. Uh, with the advent of free surfer, there, this parcellation became very, um, very, very famous, and uh, we call Descalani, Descalani cortical atlas, or in free surfer, the automatic parcellation. Um, and it's essentially these are the neuroanatomical terms that you're taught that that we teach first year med students about uh, what areas of the brain there are. Um, and we can we can find these areas of brain by looking at it by just trying to find the deepest folds, um, essentially. So there's a really deep fold here. There's a really deep fold here um, in most people's brains. So we can usually label these uh, areas pretty easy, pretty well, either as a computer or as a person. Uh, but yeah, Muhammad brought up the idea that we can also bring functional data in to try to create parcellations that are specifically useful in things like fMRI. Um, and one of the most beautiful examples here is uh, the Schaefer uh, 2018 local global models. Uh, we'll go into these in, the, in a bit later. And this one actually parcelated the brain according to function across uh, using fMRI across multiple scales. And you see that it looks very different um, from the one from the other ones. One is that you can get a lot more fine grained. Um, and, and two is that it actually labels, uh, not it associates these parcels with different uh, cortical networks or with different uh, parts of the brain that are very far apart that usually are heavily, highly correlated or highly connected to each other. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna go into the tutorial. Uh, so this tutorial, the first tutorial is in the day five code of the KCNI and I school lessons. I'm gonna put the lessons link up one more time. Uh, and I wanted to show you that this code can be opened with the Docker by navigating to the code folder. So for me, the code is sitting in my code folder and I'm home. So if I go to the place where I downloaded the code, there's this Docker Compose file, and then I can see Docker Compose. Oh. Things will happen. And then I'll see this link at the bottom. If I navigate my browser to that link, I will see a folder where I can navigate to the J5 folder, open notebooks, and open the first notebook. Awesome, okay. I also wanna show you for today, um, the better way to do this, so so um, for those of you who, who asked me for Signet accounts, Signet will not work for this today because I haven't actually moved all the data into the Signet instance or updated the Signet version of the container. Uh, and Binder will not work, which is sad because uh, of something that is totally my fault. It's gonna happen in version three, but 
we also have this very cool idea of using Google Colab. Uh, so you can also, you can, but all these, all these, uh, all these tutorials for today will work in Google Colab. So you can open in Colab by either clicking this badge or by clicking on a link here. And then we just need, we need to navigate or tell Colab to go to the GitHub instance. Uh oh, I left my casing my school lesson through. Oh. So we need to tell it. We need to navigate Colab to the KCNI School Lessons GitHub. So click on GitHub and click on KCNI School Lessons. And you will see multiple different notebooks available. So we're going to go to day five, uh, imaging service. Okay, um, and I'm gonna run through this in Google Colab. Let me know if my font size can make this huge for you. Let's see. Okay, one thing to remember uh, about Colab um, is that in this case, uh, every, so, so unlike in the Docker where I have a lot of the software already installed, in Colab we have a Python environment uh, but a lot of things are missing, including this Python package and I learned because you essentially get a clean shell. Uh, so I'm going to pip install Nylon. This should run really fast. Uh, and remember in Colab, uh, unlike other notebooks, you run code by clicking on the little run button that's sitting right beside the code. Uh, but still just like uh, Python notebooks you might have seen before, the output does exist underneath it. Awesome. So uh, I'm gonna talk about this in, uh, I'm gonna run this first. So the data that we're going to be using for uh, both the structural and the functional MRI comes from the Midnight Scan Club, and it's going to be downloaded from Open Neuro. Nice. Um, I'm going to go into why it why it's awesome actually a little bit later in the in the functional, but uh, check out Midnight Scan Club and check out Open Neuro because they are awesome. Um, and we're downloading, data should work. Okay, and we're gonna pull an atlas with Nylon. Okay. Okay, uh, so one thing, one other disclaimer is that this data, this, this first part of the tutorial is heavily pulled from this data carpentry neuroimaging. Uh, there we go. Uh, which is a repo of not one, but multiple lessons uh, to introduce you to multiple concepts of using neuroimaging data in Python. Uh, and it's followed by a diffusion by a diffusion lesson and a functional MRI lesson, which I'm gonna go into later. Uh, and actually an EEG lesson using different tools that we're actually teaching today. Um, but if you want to go more in depth into these topics, then definitely check out these lessons. Okay, so uh, for today, uh, we're gonna talk, so neuroimaging file formats, the, the most classic neuroimaging file format is called the nifty format, uh, which was introduced uh, maybe about 10, 15 years ago now, um, and has become essentially the standard and is part of the bit specification. Uh, we're gonna be using a package called MyBabel, um, which is a really great, a really amazing kind of base tool that all neuroimaging uses to be able to read in neuroimaging files uh, and a bunch of other Python packages. So let's start, let's start by reading in, oh, this one.
Okay. Uh, so we're going to start by using, so we read, we opened the, the package NIBABEL as this abbreviation NIB right here. And we're going to use it to open uh, one first uh, structural neuroimaging file. So we're going to, and write that to T1 weighted image. So when we read that file, it write, it uh, it creates an object, uh, which we're going to call an image object in Python. Um, and this image object has a couple of useful properties. So it contains the data, but it also contains something called uh, a header uh, or a nifty header, which tells you a lot of important information you need to know about um, how the scan was acquired. And especially, uh, I'm going to actually add a code block here because it gives you something called, that is really important, called an affine. Which is a, a NumPy matrix, which tells you some really information, really important information about um, how the scan is oriented and how big the voxels are um, in a math way that I won't go into. But importantly, it also gives you the data. So once we have this image, we can always get the data inside the image by using this get f data. The f uh, in get f data is actually says that it's always going to return uh, the data as a NumPy array of floats, um, regardless of what the data, what how the data was stored in the original file. Um, and this becomes really useful in the Python programming. So if we read in this image, we'll notice that it is a NumPy data array. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen NumPy data arrays, uh, NumPy data arrays are essentially, NumPy data arrays are ways to represent data that could exist in multiple dimensions. Uh, when we look at neuroimaging scans, we're going to be looking at three-dimensional NumPy data arrays. So you can think of it as cubes of numbers, or we can think about the neuroimaging scan as, have, as having been collected as cubes of numbers. Uh, and those cubes, uh, we refer to them as individual voxels. So a three-dimensional pixel, so this is, and in two dimensions, we have pixels of information, and in three dimensions, we have voxels, uh, or for volume, pixels, voxels. Um, so neuroimaging scans, especially your T1-weighted scan, are collected as slices, sli or multiple slices, so multiple pictures stacked on each other uh, that become a voxel. Uh, so how do we actually figure out the shape or the dimensions? It's a NumPy data array, so we can actually call shape on it. Um, and we can notice that for, for this individual scan that I that I looked at, this is a real raw scan that came from the Midnight Scan Club, uh, Midnight Scan Club project. Uh, we can see that it actually has 240, 224 slices, and that these slices were essentially images that were squares of 256 by 256. And if we multiply those together, uh, we realize that that means we have oh God, over a million, 1.4 million numbers uh, in this huge cube that makes up everyone's brain. That's a lot of uh, information about, just to tell you the fact that you can imagine a neuroimaging scan is someone fitting a big box over your head and putting your brain inside of it, and then chopping that box into multiple little pieces. That, that's that's morbid. but. Uh, that's essentially what a neuroimaging scan is thinking of. Uh, we can slice that box three different ways and plot it uh, using neuro using uh, nylon plotting plot and that. So here, actually, sorry, I didn't say we we loaded another package called nylon. Nylon is a magical thing. Um, it's neuroimaging. It's, it's from a group that originally wanted to do uh, machine learning with neuroimaging. It's from the same group who actually, uh, some of the same investigators who actually invented scikit-learn, uh, decided they wanted to use scikit-learn tools for neuroimaging, and they called that package nylearn, and that package is becoming the de facto package we use for, for manipulating and understanding neuroimaging tools. Um, and nicely, it has a function inside in Python. So nicely, it has a function inside called plot and that, and we can use this plot to actually slice to look at three slices going through the brain. Um, so this is, yes. Any questions so far? That's true. 
Yes. So uh, this is this is something that uh, that John brought up is that uh, you can you see that we have a big box going around the brain and we can cut through it. But you notice there's a lot still of blackness on the outside and skull and face in this case. Uh, this is an unprocessed brain image. Okay. Now we're going to talk about um, atlases and and the ways that we cut the brain apart. And we're going to start with that atlas I talked about, the Harvard-Oxford atlas. Uh, nicely, uh, Nylearn also has a Nylearn data sets uh, module, which can actually just fetch data for you um, to use in the, to use in your demonstrations. And we're going to fetch uh, the classic, the Harvard-Oxford atlas, which is the atlas that used to be involved in multiple neuroimaging investigations. Uh, and we can notice that this. Uh, neuroimaging object actually has two pieces to it. It has a maps and labels. Uh, the labels themselves are very useful. Uh, the labels tell the labels is actually a list that tells us uh, all of the brain areas that exist inside this atlas. So what they're called. And the other thing it has is a link to a nifty image. Uh, so if we look, if we plot maps, we can find out that 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 image has been downloaded uh, into a place and it has the extension ng.gz, so we know it's nifty. And we can load, we can actually plot that image directly in Nylearn. Um, and we can see it plotted on top of an average brain using this plot ROI function. Uh, and we can see all these different colors are different brain areas in this atlas and every different, every voxel in this atlas has a different color, meaning that every brain area is ascribed to a different brain region in this atlas. Uh, we also have a feature uh, to just change view type to contours and make a slightly different plot uh, where it's plotting the outside of the brain regions. Wait for it, there it is. Um, so now instead of plotting the brain regions filled in, we can just plot outlines around them, which looks kind of cool. Okay, so what is in this atlas? This atlas, uh, this atlas is actually itself a nifty image. So we can load it and we can look at its shape. We can see that it's actually um, smaller than our original uh, raw image. It's 90, 91 by 91 by 109. Uh, but if we look at the data inside this image uh, using NumPy's unique function, we find out that every single voxel in this image has a number between 0 and 48. So those numbers actually represent um, the individual brain regions. So when we look at this spot, it means that everything that's in cyan here is just one uh, integer number. That's how we're making a brain atlas. And these bre these uh, numbers between 1 and 48 actually correspond in order to uh, the list. So we can put these two things together into a pandas data frame and understand that everywhere in the image where we see the number 23, that's the lateral occipital, occipital cortex inferior division. Um, so let's use this information together. Uh, we're going to focus a little bit on the subcolossal cortex for reasons that will come up in the uh, neuroimaging talk. So let's look at the subcolossal cortex, which is, can anybody see which number is it in this table? Where is it? It's right here. So subcolossal cortex is number 27. Uh, in this table, which means that where number 27 exists in the in the nifty image is where you can find subcolossal cortex. Awesome. Thank you, Samar. So we can use that information uh, using Nylearn's math function to say, give me a new image where uh, every where there's true or ones everywhere where uh, the value in the image is 27 and there's zeros elsewhere and plot that image, and we get uh, an image that only contains subcolossal cortex um, to make that. And this is subcolossal cortex. It's cortex underneath the corpus callosum, so it's sub to the corpus callosum. Okay. 
Now, uh, very important, let's look at, so uh, in, the, in the maps above, uh, you'll notice that when we use Nylern's plot ROI function, uh, we get, we, it automatically puts a brain in behind uh, this image, even though the image doesn't contain a brain, the image just contains um, a bunch of ones and zeros of integer values. And the image that it puts in behind by default is something called the MNI template or a template brain. So it's nobody's brain, it is the average brain. Um, and it's a little bit blurry and it, it looks like a brain, but it's actually nobody's brain. It's the average of the brain of hundreds of people. Uh, but we can also try plotting this on top of an individual real person's image. Uh, so let's see what that looks like. Uh, to do this, we're just actually going to switch. We're going to run plot ROI again, but we're going to change this one argument to say that the background image now should be the T1 weighted image that we just loaded. Wait for it. Wait for it. And it looks terrible. Um, we can see that the ROIs and the brain do not overlap at all. Uh, this part, which is supposed to be in the front, is, is not even in the brain. It's like in the nose. Um, can anybody tell me why this is happening? Or guess why this is happening? The reason why uh, is that the image that we that we pulled that we plotted is the raw image coming out of the scanner, so it has not been pre-processed um, and has not been normalized normalized or registered to any template. Meaning, you can't use the atlases on it right away. You uh, so take home message: you cannot use atlases just on raw data that you pull uh, because we have this problem. Um, it's just sitting anywhere in space. Um, if we take, that looks bad. Uh, luckily, so what we need to do is take a pre-processed image or an image that's been registered or warped to the template to try to put the brain in the same place as where most atlases are. Uh, so luckily, uh, the Midnight Scan Club actually did make a brain available that does this. We can plot this, a brain available that has been pre-processed and normalized to an average. And if we plot the ROIs over that version, uh, we then see that the ROIs generally do actually fall in the brain areas where they think where we think they should. Um, a disclaimer is that they don't fall perfectly in the areas where we think they should. Um, and that's probably because this pre-processing pipeline isn't the one that this atlas expects. Um, and there's a whole land of uh, way too much work going into way too much work going into what atlas to use and what templates to use and how to do this pre-processing pipeline uh, but one thing to keep in mind uh, as you're doing this is the best thing to do to figure out uh, if things are going right is to actually check um, actually before you start uh, going forward with data that's been parcelated double check that your parcelation is actually fitting with the brain Ooh, do we have a question Reconstructed image. Ooh. So there's a couple. So we have one question from Merit, which is uh, given the fact that the original MRI output is numerical, why not use those data instead of images? Um, so, it, so Merit, did you actually speak directly to to the case space output coming directly from the scanner? Um, but one reason is the reason that I just gave you here, which is if you take the raw data from the scanner, you won't know where the brain is. Yes, we will go, we will go in when we get to the functional section, we'll talk about the registration process, but, but the truth is that the registration process is very, is, uh, yes. Um, 
so so uh, the main the main problem for me is that that if you if you take the data directly off the scanner, you won't know where the brain is. So you're going to be very limited uh, in any type of analysis where you need to know where the brain is um, or where different brain regions are. That's what all of these preprocessing pipelines that take a surprising long long amount of time uh, is meant to do them. In order to do the registration process, unless you're working for a lab that actually uh, that actually specializes in in the software engineering of the registration process, uh, this is one of those cases where I'd say do not learn, do not do this yourself. Uh, there's now, um, and this is why I teach you guys Docker's in this class. There's multiple Docker's that contain pipelines uh, that do all these registration for you and and work relatively intuitively to the point where you just need to learn how to run a Docker and how to annotate the metadata or how to organize or name your files. And then hopefully you should be able to do everything. Uh, and we'll, we'll go a little bit into that um, in the second section when I talk about fMRI preprocessing because these things go hand in hand. Uh, I want to leave time for uh, the next piece. So I'm going to go into surfaces. Uh, finding the surface is also the hardest part of fMRI. Um, or of structural MRI. And these are pictures I put in the slides, which is that when we figure out where the surface is, uh, we're, and this is, this is actually multiple hours of processing, uh, is the blue line and the red line, uh, then we can actually fit a mesh to these surfaces. Um, and the mesh, if you, if you zoom in, kind of looks like this. It's a bunch of triangles. And those triangles have this concept of vertices, which are the points around the triangles, and this concept of faces. So let's look at, I don't know why this cell is human. Let's look at one mesh. Okay. So this is an example of one mesh file, um, which is now in something, it's something called the Gifty file format. Uh, which means that it ends in .surf .ghi. Um And we can look at it using this function called plotsurf that's available in MyLearn. Uh, and I told you from this picture that, that surfaces have vertices and they have faces. So we can use actually NiBabel to get those vertices and faces using this line here. So after we load the data, it's this surf ag data function that we can use to take the point set and the triangles. If we run this, we can see we get two objects back, peel verts with zero the vertices. So vertices, all of the vertices are x, y, z coordinates of all of the points. So there's an x, y, z coordinate for this point, an x, y, z coordinate for this point, an x, y, z coordinate for this point. So uh, what we get is a list or a two-dimensional array where the first dimension is just the list of vertices and the second dimension is x, y, z. And then we also get faces. Faces are kind of interesting. They also have three locations. But what it is is kind of a description of the graph. So for every vertex, every face is rounded by three vertices. And this says that for the first triangle, it's surrounded by vertex number 68, number 12, and number zero. Uh, so what this is, is a list of the three vertices referent where the coordinates are given above, where, where that, this, that triangle, that surround one triangle. Um, and we can see that these are true. So both of these, both of these have the exact same length and actually the number of unique values in faces because it's actually a reference to the points uh, to actually the index of which line, the index of the vertex should be here. So if we do number of unique values in faces, we should actually get the length of vertices, which is true. Which in this case is about 32,000. It's a pretty long array. There's a couple of things to remember about surfaces. Before we move on, um, and I made some plots to try to make this true. The first, which is kind of the coolest thing, is that uh, everybody's surface is folded a little bit differently. This is true even for two identical twins, which is kind of cool. Uh, you, the folding patterns of your brain is very are unique to you, and they're unique to only you, like a fingerprint. 
So if we plot somebody's peel surface, uh, we see if we plot if we plot in this case the outside of somebody's brain for two people, we see different folding patterns, and this is going to be true wherever we look. Um, so this is one participant from the this is one participant, and this is the second participant, and we can see they have different folds um, in multiple places in their brain. Uh, the second is to remember that every cortex is actually made out of two surfaces. So if we look up at the picture at the top. To understand the cortex, we have uh, one surface, which is depicted in blue here, which is the border between white matter and gray matter. We usually refer to that in the file name as uh, white, dot white, or white. And then there's this red line, and the red line is the out border between gray matter and the outside of the brain. We call this peel because there's actually something called pia matter, which is this tiny membrane that protect like a little skin around and the outside of your brain called pia. Uh, which is why we call this surface that's in red a uh, peel, a peel surface. So if we look at for the exact same hemisphere for the exact same person, where are you going? Uh, we see that the peel surface looks like uh, looks like what we imagine a brain looks like because it's showing you the outside of the brain. The white surface looks weird and chunky, um, and that's because uh, that's because it's actually in the inside layer of your cortex. So it's if you were to scrape all of the gray matter out, that's what this would look like. Uh, but both of these need to be used in combination to figure out something like the thickness of the cortex. Uh, the other thing that's important is that you have two hemispheres. Uh, so for most of this demonstration, I'm only going to be uh, plotting the left hemisphere. And a lot, a lot of times we only plot the left hemisphere or the right hemisphere to make our plots uh, smaller and prettier. But the truth is there's multiple different views or multiple different sides to your brain. Uh, so this is uh, the outside of both sides of your brain, the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. Uh, and, we, and we're actually not even looking at... Um, the other side of this cortex. So there's a lateral side and a medial side. I thought I had medial lateral in here somewhere. Okay. The last thing, which is kind of cool, is that we can also look at, uh, we can also use surfaces. We can also define atlases on surfaces. So one example is Free Surfer A Park. Uh, and we have an A Park version um, of the surface uh, in this label.e file. Uh, we can plot it, we can make a pretty plot on the surface um, and give it where we give it as a map. But let's talk for a little bit about what's in that label file. So there's uh, this label file actually contains uh, only contains one big column of values. Um, and that big column of values are unique values for the label. Uh, but they reference different uh, different places on the surface. So every um, every value here references a different vertex on the surface. Uh, and we can link. And we also have inside of this in this very weird place. Um, we also have inside of a label file, which is a gifty, uh, the the name of those regions. We can grab them here, and we can use that information uh, to figure out. To, to grab potentially even the vertices that are related to one label and to plot them. That was a lot. I'm gonna exit that now and let John take over and talk about tractography because I took a bit of time. In. Yeah. And that, that was a really compro. I'm just hearing a little bit of noise there. That's is my is my uh, oh. audio okay? Yeah. Let me know if my audio's. Yeah, it fine. was it was loud. Um, yeah, start, like, but it seems okay. <laughs> it's okay now. Great. Uh, fantastic run through for Aaron. And those are the 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 foundations, 
um, of working with neuroimaging data is, you know, what are the files, what are the formats that the data come in, and then we do interesting things with them once we once we have that foundation. So that's that's where we're going next. Um, now, what I'm going to do is uh, share some slides and then go do the same thing. Go to a um, a collab notebook. Less slides this time around, so I think we should be good for uh, hitting our 10.30 um, wrap-up time for this part of the morning. Yeah. If not, we might be able to push a little bit of tractography into the second session, too. We, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I would be not against that. Let's see how it goes. Cool. Um, I certainly don't want to you know, rush it. Okay, so um, let me just resume the slideshow from where we left off. And um, yeah, so Aaron was telling you about parcellations and so on. Um, and now we're, we're um, up to diffusion MRI and diffusion MRI tractography and connectivity, that kind of particular combo. Now, what I'm what I'm not gonna do right now is is uh, embark on a, on a lecture about uh, uh, MR physics and the kind of the, the 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 nuts and bolts of of how diffusion MRI works because that that would kind of take us too far, but but some some initial comments. So what we what we what we've seen with um, the the data types that we've been looking at so far, Aaron was focusing a lot on T1 weighted MRI, which is a type of structural MRI, and you have this um, this tissue contrast that we we call it that gives you. Uh, dark in the in the ventricles and where there's fluid and uh, gray in the gray matter and white in the white matter um, with diffusion um, we we use a particular uh, rather interesting feature of the um, what we call the uh, microstructure of of brain tissue or if you like just tissue in general which is that there's lots of water there okay um, I mean but to be honest, all MRI does this because most most of the signal from MRI is coming from hydrogen hydrogen protons that have been uh, uh, that have been uh, affected in one way or another by their kind of external milieu, depending on the contrast that you're using. So everything kind of uses water with MRI, um, <laughs> as or most things. But with with diffusion MRI, what we're doing specifically is where we're, we're using using the diffusion pattern of water as a a, um, a a kind of fingerprint that gives us information about this this thing that I mentioned before the microstructure of um, of specifically brain tissue here but you say tissue in general um, the idea is that the, the if you have some um, some membranous structure that prevents it doesn't need to completely uh, restrict, but it, if, it, if it just it basically slows the passage of water um, through it or in that particular direction, then water will pref will preferentially diffuse parallel to those those kind of restricting structures. Um, and in particular, those those kind of restricting structures those are present in the white matter. So it's these long axons that we have in uh, in large like myelinated fibers. Those those basically like long pipes that it's easy for water to flow along parallel to the pipe, but it's difficult for water to flow perpendicular to the pipe because the pipe is in the way. Um, so that, that's kind of the basic uh, intuition behind diffusion weighted MRI. Um, in practice, what we get, you know, coming to the, the, the stuff I have on the slide here is uh, just, just as we have with, um, with, the T1s and also fMRI, which we'll hear about later. You know, we, we get we get images. Um, we won't talk about all of these, but the uh, the one on the uh, right hand side here, this is what we call a a, a, a diffusion weighted image, a B0 image in the kind of technical um, terminology, where the the um, the brightest part of the image is the um, area, the voxels that have the most diffusion. Um, and uh, in this case, as, as you can, can imagine, the uh, the brightest parts are the ventricles because the ventricles are full of liquid, they're full of fluid. So there's going to be a lot of free diffusion around the ventricles, less 
diffusion in other parts of the brain, but we're not really interested in the ventricles. We're interested in these other parts of the brain, to some extent the gray matter, but in particular the white matter. So what we get is a um, four dimensional images um, and we'll see, we'll see this in detail when we, uh, when we go through the tutorial in a second. We have four dimensional images where our three dimensions are the three dimensions of space. And the fourth dimension is this thing called the diffusion gradient, which is the, it's, um, it's a parameter that we set with the scanner that says we're gonna read off an image for diffusion in a specific direction. Um, and we basically supply a number of different directions and read off the diffusion strength in each of those directions. And then because we sample the directions in a three-dimensional, uh, on, on a full kind of th um, three-dimensional um, sphere surface, then we know about diffusion in all, uh, in all directions in 3D space. And we can do some, we can infer things about the geometry um, of the structures that are impeding on the diffusion. So, so we start with these, um, these image volumes, and then what we get to um, is firstly, so this, this image on the left-hand side here, this is showing you a slice of, um, it's a, an a, a axial slice of the uh, corpus callosum. So it's kind of imagine you, you kind of chop my head off in the middle there, just around where my the top of my ears are. You're looking at the corpus callosum, so left hemisphere on the left, right hemisphere on the right, and this thing is the uh, it's the front part of the corpus callosum, the the genu of the corpus callosum that is um, connecting the left and the right frontal lobes, basically. Now, each of these little cubes here, these are voxels, and in and the, the background image here, the kind of white and dark structure, that's the um, the uh, is actually this, this thing on the on the on the back here, which is called fractional anisotropy, which um, I'm going to I won't, I won't go into the full details of it, but it tells you how much how much um, orientational uh, preference there is in any given voxel, without necessarily telling you what the orientation is. So basically, when we have high high FA, where there's and high, you know, usually with images, high is bright, so high is the white bits. These these bits are bit are parts of the brain that have strong uh, diffusion anisotropy, so preference for water to go in one specific direction, and um, and that specific direction is along the orientation of the fiber bundle, um, as I said. So this is the overlaid on the background, and then these three dimensional little little glyphs here, these are telling you the actual orientation and also the uh, the. Um, the strength of the orientational preference of the diffusion. So the key thing here is that, as you can see, if you hopefully this, this is clear enough for you guys to see, that these these spheres, sorry, these uh, um, what is the what is the right term for this? Uh, spheroidal um, objects. They're not spheres. They're they're kind of three D cylinders. Oh, cancers. It, Ellipsoids, <laughs> ellipsoids. Ellipsoids. Yep. These, these ellipsoids are, uh, thank you, Aaron, uh, are pointing in a specific direction. They're pointing along the orientation of the corpus callosum. As I said, the corpus callosum takes fibers from the left of the, um, side of the brain and takes them to the right side of the brain. So they're, they're pointing along this orientation. And you can see they kind of turn uh, to the, well, the kind of antero, uh, anterior and left right and then they turn into this like fully left right um orientation and then kind of going back again but also heading over to the right as well so the orientation that you're seeing in these these ellipsoids each of these individual uh, glyphs here this is this is a what we call a there are a few different technical terms for this but one is an orientational distribution function um this is it's a it's it's a diffusion tensor but it's a it's an it's a type of orientation distribution function estimate. It's a, a three-dimensional shape that gives you the orientation and gives you the, the magnitude as well. So when these things are more like pointy kind of cigar shapes, 
then the the orientational preference is stronger. And when they're more like flat kind of um, dish shapes, well, as you can see here in these darker parts, then there's less orientational preference. So we can tell from the shape of these things what the degree of preference is and what the direction of the preference is um, as f from the uh, from the orientation of the of the uh, of the ellipsoid. And these are three dimensional objects, by the way. You're looking at them in two dimensions, but this is this is like situated in three D space, like a no, like this. Right. Da, 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 da. Now, the final point on this image, and then we'll move into the tutorial, is that um, uh, is is that we have this white line here. Right? So the white line is a uh, it's a demonstration of what we're doing when we're doing this thing called tractography tractography or streamline tracking. And it's, it, I think it's super intuitive, right? It's just, we, we just want to thread a line through this orientational orientation field that's given to us by the our, um, information that we're getting on the microstructural, um, microstructural information, including microstructural orientation, threading a line through. And then basically that line is telling us, uh, giving us an estimate of the spatial trajectory of the white matter fiber bundle, right? And this image on the right-hand side here, this is uh, one that the, you actually see quite a few of these because they tend to be quite pretty, but um, this is a, what you would say a kind of segmented version of a tractography streamline set where um, this is so many, many of these streamlines moving through multiple different parts of the brain. The one you can see in purple here, so it's, you're looking um, side on. So, um, so the back is the occipital lobe, frontal lobe at the front. This purple thing is the superior longitudinal fasciculus, so the kind of frontotemporal fiber, uh, dorsal fiber system. The corpus callosum uh, would be kind of hidden away, but it would it would actually be this blue thing here at the back. Um, so this blue thing is actually going left to right, um, and and so on and so forth. So. Uh, Alternate fasciculus here. This little red one at the front. This this connects the anterior part of the temporal lobe to the uh, uh, orbito inferior part of the frontal lobe, and also a bunch of medial insular structures along the way. So we have all this wonderful geometric structure um, in the white matter that we can we can obtain um, from these non-invasive estimates of the diffusion. Uh, diffusion micro, uh, microstructure driven by the diffusion diffusion driven by the microstructure geometry good and then the final step to getting towards our connectomics which is what we're focusing on here is we take these streamline estimates and we combine them with these these parcellations which um, we're already familiar with now thanks to Aaron's introduction and this this combination of these two things gives us our our connectivity matrix or our connectome because we can say, okay, give me, for each of these brain regions, tell me which of these streamlines connect this parcel and this parcel, this parcel and this parcel, this parcel and this parcel, and so on, repeat for every combination of parcels, and that's what your matrix is here. So it's every every parcel, every kind of from, um, and every two on the, on the, on the, uh, uh, the y-axis and the rows, and then every two on the um, x-axis of the columns. And uh, with diffused MRI, we think about these matrices being symmetric because there's, there isn't really um, a, a meaningful preference in terms of like A to B versus B to A. Um, we just kind of find the ones that connect A to B, A and B. Good, so this is our connectome. So this is what we're gonna do in our tutorial now. Um, what I'm gonna do, so it's 10.25, uh, what we're gonna do we're going to make the make the call here. Is we're going to we're going to push this one a little bit longer, because the there's we're halfway through it and and the it's a little bit less in the final um, part of the number number four tutorial than there is in this one, so um, it makes sense to just kind of extend the extend the schedule a little bit longer. So we're going to just going to kind of keep going, but we'll also move fairly quickly through this tutorial. So as we saw, uh, as Erin described before. Um, for you to load this up. I'm going to load this up from scratch so that you can follow what I'm doing. Um, in fact, I'm going to kill some of my other tabs so that they don't get in the way. So 
So the link was dropped in the in the uh, in the chat there, which is the the Casey High School Lessons repo that you've seen already. If you go to day five, we have this uh, opening collab uh, button or badge as they call it. Just go to there, and then it will give you an option for notebooks to choose. We're going to go day five, New Imaging Connectomics O2 Anatomical Connectivity. Great. So this this tutorial we're going to go through um, is is uh, similarly to um, how Aaron described with the software carpentry. This is based quite closely on uh, a tutorial from the DiPi um, the DiPi software um, website, which I'm just going to kind of point to. Oh, I didn't put the link to the website there. So this is just the link. Uh, my bad, actually. But you, you can find this on the on the on the DiPi website. But I don't want to give uh, give kind of kudos and juice to, to the to the people who put this together. And we're kind of taking it and extending it and focusing on some specific components. Um, <clears throat> now, um, as we saw before, we're in Google Colab. So people who aren't super familiar with Google Colab. The slightly the the one main unintuitive thing for a Python user about Google Colab is you, you, you need to always start by, you'll get this message if you uh, if you loaded it up the way I did, but just, just click run. You always have to start by installing the libraries that aren't standard kind of scientific computing stack libraries. Um, and it, it's a bit unintuitive because one thing that you're used to doing as a, as a Python user is kind of getting your environment set up and getting things installed and getting all the things that you need and, and do that once. Whereas with Colab, you kind of go in and you just install stuff straight away. But in fact, it's actually not a super, not not as ridiculous as it kind of maybe initially seems because the installation is really quick, um, and and the, that it's clearly kind of helpful to just not have to support a lot of uh, specific environment configurations. So we just go in, we we click install, then um, let's run through. So first, we're just going to do some imports. The main tools we're using here are. Uh, uh, DiPi for a lot of tractography stuff. This is a sense of diffusion imaging in Python, but also we're going to use these so these uh, tools that uh, Aaron pointed to before. So NiBabel for I/O and NiLearn for some visualization things. We need to do this. Okay, so just so we'll just load in the data first. So first, I want to know. Right. Um, I loaded this up from scratch, but it actually remembered that I had it open previously, um, which kind of somewhat defeated the point of me loaded in from scratch. But if you if uh, if you just pulled this in, then when you run run this cell here, then it will pull um, the data. So these these files here, or these functions here, these are, are data fetcher functions, um, and. Uh, if you've already run them, then uh, what it'll do? Well, when you run them, they'll they'll pull these files that we're going to use. Which are, there's three of them. There's there's the diffusion weighted data, which is um, we call a Hardy. Hardy is another technical kind of acronym for stands for high angular resolution diffusion image. Um, so the diffusion data, the T1 data, and the parcellation data. These are all nifty images, as we can see. And when you when you pull the fetcher, it'll stick them in this kind of hidden folder in your home space. So these are the files. Let's load them in and take a look. So NiBabel standard thing to kind of load the two step really. One load the file. Then second is is grab the data as in the kind of data array. Um, so quickly run those. And then a fourth uh, data type that we're also going to be using is these things called well, it's called the gradient table. Um, this is this contains the information about the diffusion encoding directions that tell that um, that's part of this the scanner sequence. I'll say a little bit more about that in a second. We won't go into too much detail on that, but we'll crank through. So <clears throat> let's let's kind of quickly look at these first two images that we had, which is the diffusion image and the um, and the parcellation image. So sorry, the T one image and the parcellation image. So you know we have our T one. This is a um, 
a native space volume, but the they've run free surfer on it. So we have this uh, this free surfer output, the A park parcellation image. I'm just overlaying it here so that you can see. So the, the colors give you to show you doesn't actually show you super well, but there are different parcels for these different um, these different colors, and they're in the space of the it's actually in the space of the diffusion image. So the T1 and the A park have been registered to the diffusion image and realigned and resliced to be in the same space as, as the native uh, diffusion data. That's how you analyze diffusion data. Is you, you take your high-res T1 image, you run your parcellation, so free surfer is some, some, if that's something that you, you need to do, typically you do. Um, you get back your, your parcellations and your surfaces and all of that, and then you, you move them into the space of the diffusion image. When I say move, you um, the the um, you might need to actually do some spatial realignment, although often things are fairly aligned because they're acquired at the same time, more or less. But also, but you definitely need to do this do this thing called reslicing, so kind of resample, so that you're on the same uh, sp kind of spatial resolution in the diffusion image space, because the T1 is normally about uh, twice the spatial resolution of the diffusion data. It's just a uh, data limitation so you can get good high-res t1 images but you can't get good high-res uh, diffusion images so easily so we downsample the t1 into the into the resolution of the diffusion so so we have our parcellation we also have a uh, a text file that's kind of useful which gives us the um the text labels of the parcellation files and these are the the desk and kiriani labels that um from the atlas that Aaron was talking about before now the diffusion data, as I said, we have um, we loaded this this thing before with uh, we had our gradient table. Just quickly back up here, so we did read bvals, bvex. We got back these things, bvals and bvex, bvals and bvex. Let's just quickly take a look at what they are. Um, bvals is a, a list of numbers, um, and what this what these numbers mean is the uh, the strength of the diffusion gradient that is applied for each of the scans. And the scans or the volume, same same kind of roughly synonymous terminology, that's the fourth dimension of the diffusion image. So we actually took a look. Did we do this up there? No, we're going to do this below. We're going to, we're going to look at the size of the diffusion image, um, and we'll see that there's one, one element in the fourth dimension for each of these bvals. Um, this is what we call a, a one-shell acquisition scheme because there's only one non-zero uh, gradient strength, which is uh, 2,000, which is kind of a standard, slightly old-fashioned uh, data quality. Um, so we have our BVLs and we have our BVEX, and the BVEX are the gradient orientations. So you can see there's a list of three-dimensional coordinates, but the easiest thing is to actually look at these as a um, plotted in three in three D. So what basically what you see here is that these these are all um, they're vectors located on the surface of a sphere, or or sometimes we say a shell. Um, so each of the each of these points on the shell that's kind of the the orientation that the gradient is pointing when it's doing the um, it's it's reading off the diffusion um, the uh, diffusion encoded. Um, MR signal, um, and we do it in multiple multiple orientations, and we can can reconstruct three dimensional geometries. So we have our our bvex located on sphere. This is what I was saying just now. So the bvals, as you can see, and the the, the diffusion data, the fourth dimension of the diffusion data. The first three are the three D space, right? So x, y, and z, and then this fourth dimension is the number of uh, diffusion weighted volumes. And you can see it's, it's 160 of them, which is the same as the number of BVALs. These volumes, we you can look at them. It's good to understand what they are, but um, we don't really look at them much unless you're kind of a methodologist. Um, so but just briefly, this is the uh, this is one of the first ones. It's actually volume three. But as we saw back up here with the BVALs, the third one, is uh, is a B, what we call a B zero, so it's not got a diffusion weighting applied. So the a B zeros actually have kind of reasonably good tissue contrast, so you can you can see a reasonable amount of structure. 
The other ones that I just put, picked two to show you here. So this is what the actual like raw data, raw diffusion data look like for single direction encodings. And what you can just about see here, I would say here, for example, is that um, there's this a lot of bright in this uh, in this um, kind of thalamic radiation area here, and that probably means actually, I actually haven't checked, but that probably means that this this specific image is a, a diffusion encoding applied on a kind of uh, anterior, inferior anterior orientation. So you get kind of different brightness in different structures if they align with the um, the diffusion gradient that's applied, one of these 160 orientations. So this is our raw data, not the main thing we want to focus on. So we're kind of moving on there. Um, now we're going to talk, uh, we're going to look at uh, tractography, running tractography. So first thing we do is we take our labels image or our APARC and we, we uh, use one of the labels in it that defines where, where in the image is a white matter. So we're going to use that label and we're going to say, um, we do this thing where we fit, um, we say fit a diffusion model. Um, CSA stands for um, constrained um, spherical harmonic. Constrained spherical harmonic, what is it? A. Deconvolution. Yeah, well, it's, but it's A. It's, you know, normally it would be D. So I'm oh. actually blanking on what the A is here. Yeah, so this is a type of. Um, a type of what we call a diffusion tissue model that is definitely not something we want we need to go into here, but this is like the equivalent of those those um, those uh, uh, 3D ellipsoids that we saw on the slides earlier on. So we fit this, doesn't take too long. We fit this at all of the locations in the white matter. Mm -hmm. um, once we have it, we're gonna run stream our streamline estimation. So the uh, I, I made a little note here. So streamline reconstruction, okay, that's finished. So I'll run this one as well. Streamline reconstruction is something that there's slow and fast ways of doing it. And the fast, the, the slow ways are often the better ways, but the kind of diminishing returns. So you can get really good tractography reconstruction, a deterministic tractography reconstruction um, for whole brain in, as we see, about 20 seconds, um, which is what we're doing here. Um, this isn't necessarily what you would use for your kind of major analyses, major publication level stuff, depending on what you're doing. Maybe you would, maybe you won't, but. Um, you can certainly do a lot very quickly, which is good for <laughs> live tutorials. Now, we'll we'll look at the streamlines a little bit here. So first is something that we can do. This is a little nylon trick, um, or a uh, dipi trick, is we can convert the uh, the streamline that we reconstructed into an image, and then view the image. Um, and that's actually quite a convenient way to do a really quick visualization of what the structures that we're getting in the in the diffusion data are. So, so we do this thing. I mean, we call it a density map. We basically say we, we assign a number at each voxel in the image, saying um, this is how many streamlines pass through there, and then we get a, a kind of map of the principal um, places where a lot of streamlines pass through. And as we basically expect, like Culp's Colosseum is one of the hotspots. These uh, large anterior um, posterior ventral pathway fiber bundles, also lots of streamlines passing through there. But we can see like a whole brain spread of white matter fibers in this very, very quick visualization approach. Um, we can also plot it. So these two plots are actually slightly different. One of the, the top one is called a glass brain, where what you're seeing is you're seeing everything from at each of these angles you're looking at, you're seeing everything all the way through. Um, and it's actually being kind of condensed and given a color scaling to say when there's lots of stuff in that specific, um, at that specific location that you're looking all the way through. The one on the bottom is a, is a slice view. So it's basically, it's not a glass brain. It's not transparent all the way through. So what you're seeing here is just um, the same data, but only on a specific um, slice X, Y, Z slice, um, and you know, pros and cons to each because you lose a lot of information with the glass brain, but you obviously miss a lot with the slice views as well. But you can see the slice that we chose here is a corpus callosum, so we can see there's a lot of streamlines going through the corpus callosum, which is what we expect. Good, so um, we're gonna carry on looking at visualizations because I want, I want to nail that, um, keep going a little bit on 
this idea of what these streamlines are to make it super clear. So what's a convenient way of doing that is to subselect some of them. So we're going to do what we're going to do is we're going to pick streamlines that part only pass through the corpus callosum. It's going to go from our whole brain streamline reconstruction to a uh, just streamlines that are passing through the corpus callosum. So again, we've got a glass brain view here and a slice view here. And what I've also added in here is a an outline image of the slice that we used. Um, so the slice was um, it's actually defined a little bit further up. Um, yeah, so we just used a, like a, a label in the in the APARC image as well, again, um, and but this is this is this is where that slice this is where the the kind of ROI that we're defining there actually sits. Um, this is an outline view that I'm showing, so it's actually kind of you know filled in, but I want to show an outline so you can see more information. So we've kind of we're just looking at the the streamlines that pass through this region now, and as you can see. Now we've got just just a rather more restricted set of um, of uh, structures that are going left left right, and we can see them actually quite well in the in the slice view here. Um, this is what mm -hmm. this is what corpus callosum looks like when you on the on the left. This is what it looks like when you view in a coronal in the coronal plane. It kind of looks like a, an upside down mustache kind of thing, or maybe something like my mm -hmm. mustache, which is upside down at the moment. Um, it's a it's a, a U shape because um, the actual like body of the corpus callosum is quite low and the cortex that it projects to is like a little bit higher up so it's like doo -doo 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 -doo. and this is the classic image of a corpus callosum here in the in the uh, um, sagittal uh, slice that we can see um, you can see it in the middle so this is this is just the corpus callosum streamlines now we're going to keep Drilling down again, and what we're going to do now is actually just do this another nice little dive by thing where we downsample the streamlines so that we can actually plot them as a scatter plot. Yeah. So this this function I'm doing here um, basically re it downsamples these streamlines. Uh, each of these these mm -hmm. things, so the elements in this this thing, CC streamlines. Take one of them. It's a list of numbers, right? So each of the it's a list of three numbers, each of those three numbers is a coordinate in that 3D volume. So that so the streamlines are points going through the volume defined by this set of coordinates. Um, and the original data, or the original streamlines, um, this is the average kind of number of coordinates is about 100. So I just listed a few of them there. After our downsampling, they're down to about 10. Um, but um, the nice thing is, that the actual quality of the or spatial information that's in those downsampled streamlines is still pretty close to the spatial information that's in the original streamline. So we can have a clear idea of what the structure looks like without compromising. And we can run a plot here that actually doesn't take too long. So uh, it takes about 30 seconds. So I'll just let that run and then we can um, we can keep going. I think I think we can, after we've finished looking at streamlines, actually we'll take our pause, do our uh, break, and then resume after the break with the second half of this tutorial, rather than push it all the way through. So it's in a kind of a natural pause point that we'll, we'll come to in a minute. Mm -hmm. I haven't checked in on the questions. Erin, any, any burning questions in the in the chat? Okay, so uh, I'll I don't see any. I'm going to throw the Gather Town link up in the chat so people can come join us and hang out or, or feel free to, to not join us and, and take a bio break because I'm sure some people need it or they need a new copy. There was a lot of exciting information this morning. Yeah. Yeah. So, we did it. So, what we've done here is that we've, we've, we've done a scatter plot with our downsampled mm -hmm. streamlines for the Cobus Colosum ones. So, the images that I showed you previously, like these things, these these are like really nice visualizations. They they require certain types of um, visualization rendering things that need kind of three D graphics and certain like C compiled OpenGL libraries to to work well. 
we can they, they are available but it's actually nice to just do stuff in matplotlib right so that's that's okay. the motivation here right so um, so we downsampled some streamlines we just picked the corpus callosum and then we can actually plot like a large number of streamlines and we can just see them as a, as a, as a as a line plot so this is what we're seeing here so this is like the the actual streamline bundle that we mm -hmm. summarized here in image form um, but you see more of the streamline information now because we've we've plotted the actual the full lines rather than just converting it to a kind of a heat map image. So, just we're gonna we're gonna deep dive on this a little bit more and just I really want to really make it clear to people like what are these things streamlines? Okay, um, and we can do that now. We're we're looking at them as scatter plots. So here I'm just showing you line plot and scatter plot. Right, um, they're just coordinate points. Right, see the dots. Okay, so the, this is what your streamline consists of. It's just a set of coordinate points. Um, when we view them as like interpolated, you know, lines, then they, they look like that. But this is this is what the raw data of a streamline is. It's a set of coordinate points like that. Yeah. Um, right. So, and and just a few more visualizations, just kind of showing that for the downsampled and the non-downsampled data. So the second part of the tutorial this tutorial is going to be taking the streamlines and then doing the thing that I showed in the slide is like combining with the parcellation and getting our anatomical connectivity. What we're going to do is take our, our break and then come back and hit this and then resume with the rest of the session. So I make it, let's just kind of round it down to 1047. So um, Aaron, when do we want to restart? 11.15 or? Yeah, we could do 11 or 11.15. I forget, we're doing, we're doing 15 minute breaks or 30 Usually we break. do 15 minutes. For okay, yeah, great. So let's, okay, yeah, let's let's come back at 11. 11 is a nice cool. round number. So hopefully this was uh, good for you guys. I will do a bio, but also hit the Gamma Town so you can come chat to me as well and see the rest of you back at 11. And um, we're going to end, end the broadcast now. You have to end the broadcast. Yeah. See you guys soon.